Well, good morning to you and to excited today to be starting our second major teaching series for the year where we are going to be going through the book of First Timothy. Uh, before I get into it, let me just uh, recap for you, it was in the announcements, but two exciting resources to kind of accentuate your journey through this important book. So firstly, those devotions that Candace mentioned on the announcements, they'll be available today on the website. They're written for, for daily readings, so Monday through Friday, uh, and kind of taking the passage that I'm preaching on each Sunday and then dividing it up into kind of devotional studies through the week. And let me just tell you, there's just always so much that I wanna say. There's so much in the passage that we don't get to, and Shelley's done a phenomenal job of just with a bit of extra time through each day of bringing that all up. So that's really going to be, I think, a great assistance to you as we journey through this book. So that's the first extra resource. And then the second extra resource is a brand new one that we're launching this week. Uh, it is a podcast, which we are calling The Scratch Pad. The Scratch Pad. And the idea there, kind of think notepad but with like a lots of scribbles and notes all over the show, uh, which is a reflection of my preaching notes, not like the ones I have here today. These ones in front of me are all nicely manicured and laid out, but what's behind this is a mess of notes, a whole bunch of information that I don't get to talk about in the sermon. And so the podcast is an opportunity to bring in a lot more material uh, from the passage and to kind of dialogue it with our podcast host, which will be our discipleship pastor, as why there as well, who's written the community group material for this. So he's also in these passages. And so we'll just be dialoguing just a lot more around the passage and taking questions from you about the passage. So I'm preaching today and you're thinking, man, I do not understand what on earth is he talking about or what does this mean or what does that mean or how does this connect with that other passage? Bring your questions, all right? Because why we'll answer them. So, but seriously, there's opportunity for you to ask, ask questions. We've already had a question come in about a Good Friday, about the Good Friday sermon, which I'm so interested and, and keen to answer this coming week. So send in your questions. That, it's also on the website. It's all there where you can submit those and we will deal with them on the Wednesday and it'll air on the Wednesday as well. So those are extra resources to help us in this journey. So why are we studying the book of First Timothy? Well, the easy answer is because it's in the Bible and everything that's in the Bible is there, is written for us today, for our instruction and for our growth. But some of you, if you've been around church for a while, if you've read through scripture and studied a little bit about scripture, it would be like, yes, but First Timothy, Second Timothy, Titus, a collection of books in the New Testament known as the pastoral epistles, traditionally understood as that's written kind of to church leaders and to pastors, which is not true. This is not, 1 Timothy is not a private letter to Timothy. It's addressed to Timothy, but it's actually written in the plural form. It is meant to be read out, to be listened to and studied by churches. So it's not for pastors, it's for churches. And in fact, it's more specifically, it's for the people that make up churches. So it's not as much even about church. And I know even in our design for this series, it it's kind of gives the impression that the series is about church. The letter's not even about church. It's written to churches, but the letter is about, guess what? What's it about? Take a wild guess. If you never know the answer in church, just like swing out of Jesus, because you're just, it's likely you're going to be right. And absolutely it is. It's a letter. It's about God. And it's written for people, the congregations of churches. Does that sound good? All right. So let's do it. Let's get started. So turn to the book of First Timothy chapter 3, where we're going to look at verse 14 to 16 today. Now, maybe you are a little bit confused because you're like, hang on, does that mean I have missed some chapters, right? As this series started earlier, why are we in chapter three if we're doing a series through First Timothy and we're starting today, surely we should be starting at chapter one. Well, we're going to kick off our series today in chapter three, 
looking at verse 14 to 16. Next week, we're going to go right back to chapter 1, verse 1, and then make our way methodically through the book. So question is, why on earth are we starting right slap bang in the middle of this book? So let me tell you why. Firstly, because what we're going to read and study today is the climax of the book. So it's the highlight of the whole book. It's kind of the crescendo. Everything in the book kind of builds around this central piece. And one of the ways that we know that, there's a couple of ways you'll see when we get into it, but one of the ways we know it is if you zoom out and look at 1 Timothy, you'll see in the beginning it starts, chapter 1, verse 17, with a little bit of a hymn. So a song, it's like a poem that marks the beginning of the book. And if you flip right to the end, chapter 6, you'll see uh, that it also ends, so verse 15 to 16, with a little bit of another song or hymn. And then here in the middle, in this passage we're going to look at today, is guess what? Another little quote of a hymn or a poem. And so there's this kind of structure to it, and the highlight is this passage that we're going to look at today. So that's the first reason, it's the highlight. Second reason is because in these few verses is the central theme of this letter, or should I say the whole purpose, the specific reason why Paul, we believe, writing this letter is writing, it comes out in these few verses that we're reading this morning. So still you think, okay, but, but why not just wait? It's the highlight it's the purpose, but then just start at the beginning. Some of you are the A-type personalities. We've got to do things in order. You're freaking out right now. Why don't we just wait till we get there? Well, because think about it. So this letter's written, and churches would receive this, and it would be read out to them in one go. And Scripture often functions like that. I mean, devotionally, we read little snippets, and we read here, there, and everywhere, but actually, it's meant to function as kind of one consistent reading. And so if it were being read from start to finish, you would get to the highlight, you would get to the purpose in like 10 minutes. So you'd be reading all the introductory matters, be thinking, man, what does this mean? What's going on here? And then you'd get to the theme, and you'd go, oh, I get it. But the way we're going to preach through 1 Timothy, we're taking two weeks per chapter, means it would be on week five that you would get to the central theme, the highlight, and then you go, oh, okay, that's what week one, two, three, and four was about. So I would rather do it now so that it sets the tone for us because this middle passage is going to do exactly that. It's going to set the entire tone for our study of 1 Timothy. So... Let's go and let's read this little passage, the highlight of this book, the central purpose of this book. And let me add this in this passage, the purpose for our lives. Central purpose for the Christian life. The secret of the Christian life is here in these few passages. That is on an oversoul. That is not me just getting a little bit overexcited and enthusiastic, which I am prone to do. You're going to see how this passage can function as the secret of the Christian life. So let's go. 1 Timothy chapter 3, reading verses 14 to 16. So Paul, we think, writing says this, I hope to come to you, Timothy, soon. It's actually you, plural. I hope to come to you soon. But I'm writing these things to you so that, see the so that is the marker. Here's why I'm writing this letter. Here's the central purpose of this book. I'm hoping to come to you, but in case I'm delayed, I'm writing these things to you so that if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God. That's where our sermon series title comes from. I write these things to you so that, in case I don't get there, you will know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. Great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of God. Godliness. 
He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. Verse 16 is trying to grab our attention. And it's what helps us see that this little passage is the highlight of this whole book. Notice that it says, great indeed we confess is the mystery of holiness. I actually like the NIV here, which says, beyond all question. Now, those are kind of grand words. It's kind of these, this verbal cue telling us that something important something incredible, something non-negotiable, essential, beyond all question, great indeed. It's like this introduction. It's like if you were introducing somebody and you said, here comes the right, reverend, revered, holy father, uh, and then pastor, right? That would be a great way to introduce oneself, right? If you use all those terms and they're just cues that the person you're supposed to expect is supposed to be important, that's exactly what's happening here. Great indeed, or beyond all question, is something really important is coming, and here it is. What's really important, incredible, non-negotiable is the mystery of godliness. The mystery of godliness. So there's the fanfare, there's the trumpets. Here's what's important, the mystery of godliness. Now let me just say, mystery doesn't mean so much mystery as in mysterious, as in mystical. It, it refers, it's used all over the Bible. Zwan and I will talk about this on Wednesday. used all over the Bible, more in a sense of something that was once hidden, but has now been revealed. That's what the word mystery means. A better word would be secret. A secret, something that's not known, but now that it's known, now it's no longer a secret, that's what's being spoken about here. So what's being introduced with great fanfare is the secret of godliness. So let's take some time this morning. That's why I love to go through books like this relatively slowly is kind of we get opportunity to pause on some things that are important. So let's just pause, let's talk for a moment about the subject of godliness. When I say godliness, what comes to mind? What do you think of when you think about the word godliness? Or when you think of somebody who is godly, what comes to mind? Is it kind of the idea of living a moral life? Is that godliness, as in not doing bad things and instead doing good things? It's generally what comes to our minds, right? Conduct, behavior, even referenced in verse 15. Moral behavior, that's what we think of when we think of godliness. Or how about if you think of the word godliness or somebody who's godly, you think spiritual? So godliness is kind of a devotion to the scriptures, to so somebody who reads their Bible a lot, who can quote the Bible, who knows the Bible, who prays a lot, is a prayerful person, wouldn't you say that person is a godly person? That might come to mind. Which is generally, you think of a godly person like somebody who just kind of talks, walks Christianity in their vocab, they've got lots of Christian vocab that they generally use in life. When they're posting on Instagram, they're going hashtag blessed and you know, all these kinds of Christian phraseology that just makes its way. Is that, what, when you, is that what you think about when you think of the word godly? What is godliness? So it comes up, this word, this particular word, eight times in 1 Timothy. That's over half the references in the New Testament are right here in this book of 1 Timothy. It shows you it's a major concern of Paul for not just Timothy, the church, people who are in the household of God. It's a major emphasis that they are godly. But still, what does it mean? 
Well, if you're trying to find out, if you're reading the Bible, and you have just some Bible study tips. If you're reading the Bible, you're trying to find out, there's a really important word. We know this is important. It's got all the fanfare behind it. The mystery, great indeed, is godliness. It's used lots of times. If you're trying to find out what that means, then you go through a bit of a process of trying to understand it. So the first thing that you would do is kind of deconstruct the word to go into kind of what, how the word is built. So for example, in English, if you were you know, wanting to figure out, you know, you never came across the word vacation. You know, and somebody's like going on vacation, like what does vacation mean? You, would, you might want to go into like how the word is built and you would find out that it comes from the Latin word vacare. I just learned this this past week and say cool things in Latin, vacare, which means, get this, to be free. Ha, ah, you see, now you get it. So vacation, you look at, well, kind of what it's built on is this Latin word vacare of to be free. So vacation means to be free from work. Yeah, right, and now you get it. It's not a holiday, it means to be free from work. So you understand the word vacation from looking at how it is built. So if you were going to the Bible, you look at, okay, this word godliness, how is it built? So as you know, probably most of you in the New Testament, originally written in Greek, which is a very precise language, and the word for godliness is the word eusebia, and the part eus, E-U-S, kind of means good, and then sebia, built on sebame, kind of means worship, revere, it's kind of mystical, it's kind of good worship, so is that helpful? Not really. It's broad, right? Okay, so that's where you get to the next part in trying to understand what this word means. And that is you're going to look at how it's used in the Bible. So I mentioned it comes up many times in this exact form, but many more times in other forms with a whole range of meanings. Let me tell you the range of meanings. This is important. You try to understand what godliness means. It's a word we throw around a ton. It has this range of meanings. So it can mean a certain attitude to God, an attitude, so kind of pious or devoted. So it's an attitude, that's one way that it's used, but it's also used uh, in a sense of the, a conduct that befits that attitude. So yes, this is the more kind of behavioral sense that we understand godliness to be, but one that is befitting an attitude or only taking that right to an extreme is a whole system or set of beliefs, i.e. a religion. So it's this attitude that leads to conduct that when it's systematized becomes a religion. So some of your translations, if you're out there reading today or you're at home, you know, reading, if you're just kind of tapping around, looking at other translations, newer translations will say things like, great is the mystery of our faith. Or great indeed is the revelation of our religion. So a lot will use that kind of sense. So I think now we're getting a little more sense of, okay, what this word means, but still, really what does it mean? It's, remember, it's important, it's got all this fanfare. Which one of those meanings is implied here? Or more importantly, what is the mystery? What is the secret of godliness? So this is where then we come to the next thing that you would do in trying to understand a word. So you've looked at how it's constructed, you looked at the different ways that it's used in the Bible, then thirdly what you would do is look at its immediate context, kind of what's happening directly around it. And this honestly is my main point for today because when you look at this, it is shocking, it is stunning, it is a revelation, and it is truly life-changing. The essence of godliness, the revelation of godliness, the secret of godliness is what? I'm waiting for a drum roll. The secret of the Christian life that's what this is saying is here, is what? Still waiting for that drum roll. It's not coming. So let's carry on reading. Here, it, just, just read, just read on. It says what? Here is the mystery, the secret of godliness. He was 
manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. The secret of godliness, the essence of godliness is He. The secret of godliness is He. Who is this he? I, t- I told you, like I gave you the prompt earlier, if you do not know the answer, <laughs> it is Jesus. And it's, it's quite obvious here. Six lines, it's the poem, it's the hymn. We don't know whether it was a song that was already there that early Christians were singing or one that Paul is writing, but many people believe these next six lines would become the foundation for the apostles Creed. So just in case it's not obvious that the secret of godliness is this he, it's not obvious that it's Jesus. Let's just run through it real quick so that we can see this. And what I love about this is because it's going to tie to Easter last weekend. This was also back in my mind, keen to start with 3 verse 14 to 16. So look at number one, the first part there. He was manifested in the flesh. Who was manifested in the flesh? Jesus is God in the flesh. It's the incarnation John 1, verse 14, the word became flesh and dwelled among us. So that could be referring to the incarnation. Could also be referring to Jesus' resurrection appearances. You know, in those 40 days after his resurrection when he was alive and meeting with people, if you've got an NIV in front of you, it won't use the word manifested. It will say he appeared in the flesh, which is what Jesus did after he was resurrected. I actually think it's more referring to the resurrection appearances of Jesus here because of the next lines. He was manifested or he appeared in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit. Man, I could have preached on this on Easter Sunday because vindicated means verified. Jesus as the Son of God, as the one who was sent to take away the sins of the world, that purpose and his person was verified on his resurrection. It's kind of that awkward, if you were here Easter Sunday, that awkward illustration I was using about the cell phone and paying for a purchase and a notification, but this is the idea. He was verified as the Son of God by the Spirit. Think Romans 1 verse 4. And he was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. It's Romans 1 verse 4. It speaks about his resurrection being the spirit vindicating him as the son of God. So when it says manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the spirit, already we're like, yeah, we know who you're talking about here. This is Jesus. Carries on. It says seen by angels, We know that angels were there at his birth, but angels were there at the tomb. They were the ones who first spoke about the resurrection of Jesus. Angels are there at the ascension of Jesus. He's the one proclaimed among nations, believed on in the world and taken up in glory. The he is Jesus, the secret of godliness is the person of Jesus Christ. Now that should shock you. That is shocking, it is startling. You can understand why great indeed is this mystery. It would shock the secular world to hear this. It would shock anybody, any devout believer of any other religion in the world would be shocked by this statement And for the most part, it's going to shock most Christians to hear that the secret of godliness is the person of Jesus. Let me explain just how radical this is. And as I do that, you'll see just how this affects our lives. So let's start with the Christians. Why is this so shocking to Christians? Here's why. Because most Christians believe that godliness is goodliness. That's a phrase I heard recently by a Bible commentator. It's a made up phrase. Goodliness. Most 
Christians believe that godliness is simply goodliness. It's, it's being good. It's behaving well. It's not behaving badly. It's instead behaving goodly. We believe that the essence of godliness is just this behavior. But the stunning truth from this passage is that the essence of godliness, the thing that is incredible and important and life-changing is that the essence of godliness is the person of Jesus Christ. What it means is if you just do a lot of things that are good, you are not necessarily godly. You're just goodly. Be very careful, Christians, when adding an extra O to godliness. That O, it's not a zero, as in it has like no value. When you add the O to godliness and you end up with goodliness, you're entirely out of the realm of what godliness truly is. The essence of godliness is our connection to Jesus. The essence of godliness is our association to Jesus. Now, I'm not going to lie. This is a mystery, as in for real mystery, as in it's mysterious. How through believing in Jesus, how through faith in Jesus, I am mysteriously united to him. Jesus is God, remember? Jesus is the way that we have access to God. And through believing, I am now united to him. And because I'm united to him, we are one, just in the same way as when you speak about a marriage where the two are no longer do distinct, but they become one flesh. It's the same metaphor used when we become Christians, is that we are now one with God in Jesus. There's a union there. This is mysterious. I don't know how it works. All I know is that through believing and through faith, I am one with Jesus, and therefore my godliness is not wrapped up in my goodliness, My godliness is wrapped up in my connection to Jesus because he is ultimately God and holy and righteous and pure. And therefore, godliness has not much to do with just external behavioral change. And it might remind you, as a Christian, if you read through In a lot of the New Testament, some of this language will be familiar to you. For example, Colossians chapter 1, 24 to 27. I'll just read the last few lines. But it says, To them God chose to make known how great, so he has these verbal cues again, how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery. Same word. And here's the mystery, this great mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's why when I said to you earlier, the secret of the Christian life is here in this passage, I wasn't lying to you. The secret to the whole Christian life is Christ in you the hope of glory. And somehow through believing in him, through trusting him, through committing our life to him, we are in this strange union with him and he lives in us, which means all sorts of things in the Christian life, like how to survive, how to deal with difficulty like we sang through those songs. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. It's everything. And here it is our godliness. Any external behavioral modification on its own without a close association to the person of Jesus Christ is empty, it's useless. And it should be discarded, considered unchristian. That's dramatic. Is that just me getting pumped up? No, no, no. Again, I'm just quoting from 
Paul writing to Timothy now in 2 Timothy, where he speaks about godlessness, the opposite of godliness. It says in 2 Timothy 3, verse 5, so these people who have the appearance of godliness but denying its power have nothing to do with them. They are not Christians when there's this appearance of godliness, but not this power, not this association. It's not fueled by personal relationship, by connection, by union with Jesus Christ. So it's shocking to Christians because mostly we think Godliness is goodliness, and the mystery, great indeed, the secret of godliness is He, Jesus. Got that? Here's how it's shocking to other religions. So this is a bit of a generalization, what I'm about to say, but if you had to think about every other major religion in the world, you could say it basically boils down, they all boil down to this. They would say that you need to have a religious experience and then from that moment on, do more good things than bad. And then kind of hope for the best when you die, that that accounting worked out in your favor. It's a generalization. It's most religions. You have a religious experience of some sort, and from that point onwards, do more good than bad and hope that you make it out of this okay. I mean, they may differ in what the religious experience is. They may differ in the definition of good and bad. But ultimately, that's what these systems are built on, doing more good than bad, and ultimately with no certainty, no assurance whatsoever of an eternal destination. You just don't know. You just pitch up after life, and you know, as the scales are being balanced, you just kind of hope which is very unhelpful for three reasons. I remember hearing this from Pastor John Piper. First reason why this is so unhelpful. I don't know about you, but I struggle to be good all the time. Just me? Okay, one other person. I, I just struggle. I was driving to church this morning. I got my wife there, I got the kids in the car. It's a beautiful morning. It was a relatively easy morning. We got the kids up like 15 minutes, dressed in the car. It was like a miracle. On our way, I'm sipping my coffee. The coffee was tasting great, by the way. I did a great job making it. It was just beautiful. And then I'm like driving up, you know, Marlborough Road, you know, coming there, and it's wide open. There's no other car on the road. It's three lanes, maybe two, but I'm exaggerating for effect here. And I'm in the right-hand lane because I'm about to turn right. And this guy comes behind me, flashing like mad. It's wide open, the road. Like, you can just go, I'm about to turn, you know? I can't tell you how my blood boiled inside of me. Like, just, I'm just so glad Kristen and the kids were there because that prevented me, I think, from doing something ungodly. You know, that, that, that just happens. It just happens. You know, I, that's me. Like, if, if everything came down to just the balance of goodliness... I don't back myself very far in that equation. So that's unhelpful. Secondly, what happens to all the bad that I do and did before the religious experience? Like it's still there. And there's no assurance at all that I'm going to be okay just living in the sense of I just hope. Only in Christianity. Only in Christianity are you able to satisfy these three things. Where A, my goodness is not ultimately linked to me and my good behavior. It's linked to Jesus who's perfect. That's where my goodness comes from. Amen, somebody else that feels this also had a road rage incident this morning, I don't know. You know, but it's linked, like, how could you live with this weight? But in, yeah, what do we hear the mystery, the secret of godliness, is it's his godliness, and we're united to him. Secondly, as a Christian, I know that my badness 
It's not only just that my goodness comes from Jesus, my badness is washed away. It's gone. It's erased from the record book. There's no accounting of good and bad. And like, well, there's a lot of bad that you did in your life, but thankfully your good is Jesus. I mean, that is amazing. That on its own is enough. But it's not just that. It's more than that. It's here. Let's just wash away all the bad stuff too. That's Christianity. So we celebrated this past Easter weekend. It's canceled that record of debt. It is covered over. It is washed away. Not only do I have to worry about my goodliness coming from me, which is terrible, but also I know that all the badliness is erased. And ultimately, I know, I can know that I'm okay. Eternally. Because Jesus exists now and I'm united to him. Like, you can just know that. You can know that today. Never have to worry. So you have assurance, you have relief, and you have a real hope that he can actually work this out in my life and change me. So it's, it's shocking to Christians, not goodliness, it's shocking to other religions. They would be amazed by this. And thirdly, it's shocking to the world because it's not just religious people who are trying to be good. Let's acknowledge that. There's a ton of other people out there. Most of the world, deep down inside, is trying to be good, thinks about what good is, and tries to be good. Humanity is on a journey of goodliness too, which is why it doesn't make you Christian to just be goodly. A lot of non-Christians I know are goodly too, and they try very hard to be goodly. I'm saying we're goodly a lot, so they can be stuck in your mind. So there's, when we speak about secular people who are pursuing morality, there's a word for that, a philosophy called humanism or humanists. And basically the philosophy of humanism is that human beings are capable on their own, left to themselves, are capable that if we pay enough attention, that if we think about it hard enough, that if we're smart enough, left to ourselves, we can actually be better people and we can make the world a better place. We do not need any external help. Thank you very much. We're okay on our own. Human beings are amazing. That was a little bit sarcastic, so let me give you the academic definition in fairness of what humanism is. So this is from the American Humanist Association it says, humanism is a progressive philosophy of life that without theism, so without God, they're clear about that, a philosophy of life that without theism or other supernatural beliefs affirms our ability and responsibility to lead ethical lives of personal fulfillment that aspire to the greater good. That's humanism. And you may have picked up from my sarcasm that I really do wonder at that. I really do wonder that if the solution to all the evils of society is that if we just kind of take enough time to think a little bit harder, be smarter, that we'd be better people in a better society that you can get rid of societal evils, systemic evils, simply through awareness, education, and policing. Which is what, that's what humanism is, is built on, just with enough awareness, with enough being smart and intelligent and enough policing that like, we can do this. What we found, I think, as human beings, is that we haven't got rid of evil by being smarter, we just got smarter at being evil. Is that true? We haven't got rid of evil by being smarter. We're way smarter at being evil, though. We haven't stopped killing people. We're just way better at killing people these days. We have phenomenal technology to dispose of human beings in an efficient manner. It hasn't stopped us killing people. It hasn't stopped us indulging in our sordid passions and desires. We just have many more ways to do that far more efficiently from the phone in your pocket and many other ways. We're far more efficient at mobilizing our prejudices. We're not better off being left to ourselves. 
Humanity left on its own is a mess. We need intervention from the outside. That's what we need. And as Christians, that's what we read. The mystery of godliness, the mystery of good behavior, the mystery of what will actually change us, what will actually change people and society is Jesus and union to him and belief in him. The world needs to know that. Otherwise, it is just a tireless striving in the opposite direction. It's just not working, is it? You're humanist as you like, the evidence is that it's not working. That's how this is so shocking. The secret of godliness is he who was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by the angels, proclaimed in the world, believed on, and taken up for glory. And the church, which see, we don't get to get into all sorts of stuff. I was gonna say a bit, but I'll leave that. The church, the first few verses here, we're not a gathering here of humanists, obviously. Humanists would find this stupid. Honestly, they would. I would want humanists to walk in here and go, these oaks are crazy. Because what it says in verse 15, what it describes the church is the household of God. God's house, the temple, this rich language of God's presence dwelling. We would say that. We would say we're in the, the household of God, the church of the living God. We're very aware that God is here. And so actually, we do believe in religious experiences. Yes, because we believe in the living God who's present, who manifests himself when we gather together. But that religious experience doesn't lead us to some kind of nirvana state or some kind of you know, weird, it leads us to, come on, you all prepped you enough, thank you, to Jesus. We very much believe in that because we come together as the church of the living God. So let's pray, knowing that he's here and listening. God, we gather before you. The living God. And we know that you're alive. And we just celebrated, even when you, God, the living God, came to earth and lived as a human being, wrapped in the weakness of human flesh and died, you still came alive. You're the living God among us. And that's amazing. We absolutely declare, acknowledge supernatural intervention from the outside. We absolutely honor you as a God, the God of the universe who is accessible to us. Thank you, Jesus. And so we come before you in this gathering of the household of God in your presence and declare our union with you. Just We believe in you, Jesus. We believe in you, Jesus. We believe in you, Jesus. Thank you that our godliness is in you that our badness is washed away and that we can be secure and live with an eternal hope. Amen. Thank you for listening to this sermon from Rosebank Union Church. If you've enjoyed this message, please feel free to share it with others. And if you would like to support the work of Rosebank Union Church, please visit the giving link on our website at ruc.org.za.